All right, we're uh, going to call the Policy Review Committee meeting to order. Uh, today is Monday, August 27th, 28th, uh, 6 p.m., or the Daniel Boone Administration Building. Connor Kurtz. Jeff Scott. Bob Hurley. Uh, let the record show Scott Potts and Carol Bites are not in attendance, and Superintendent Harris could not uh, attend this evening's meeting. All right. So <clears throat> if you look at old business, we had three things that are sort of in progress. I'll skip to, to policy 215. Um, this is the, uh, Mr. Hurley, this is, uh, you were going to review this recommendation of the classroom teacher shall be required for promotion or retention of a student. Yeah, we're Comment. okay with that. Let me tell you why. After we, I reread this, it, it, the phrase right below that, it says the building principal shall be assigned the final responsibility. As long as that clause is there, I'm okay with it because the teacher can recommend which they do through their grades, but the building principal gets the final say in regards to that. So it basically means we are asking their particular, and the teachers do that basically through the grading practices, and then the so, final say goes to the building principal. So I take that as... We're fine with it. Unless the, the classroom teacher says this person shouldn't go to the next grade, it's assumed that they're promoting each kid and the, and the building principal would essentially make the final call if, if someone should or shouldn't go. Yeah. Or unless there's some other one-off situation involving the parents. Yeah, basically that's it. I mean, that's basically what you're looking at. Um, you know, it gives the principal the final say. Um, sometimes there's reasons kids start school uh, very young sometimes, and uh, for social reasons, the family asks them to be held back. And there can be a whole slew of reasons why a principal may um, hold a, it doesn't happen often, but they may hold the student back uh, when it's in their best interest. So, but it basically gives them the discretion to get basic all the information. So this is fine as right. It's our recommendation. All right, we're going to move to first reading. Yep. So 209. So this was the uh, health examinations. So you want to, you want to, I'll let Kat, uh, can I let Kathy know that you're going to send her the phrase to I'll add send her my phrase. and where to put it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, upon receiving your edit, we'll move. You, uh, you good with that? Here, just for you, so you guys know, um, we did officially get the letter from PPE. Um, we got it from them, so we have our files also. Same thing, so yeah.
All right. And then this one was the nepotism policy. So we had, we needed uh, PASBA to, PSBA to clarify because it conflicts with another policy that they have, uh, 304. Uh, there's those 304.1 versus 304. One specific to nepotism says, um, no applicant for an employment who is a relative of any school director, commissioned officer, professional employee, management level employee, shall be employed by the school district provided, however, that this policy shall not prohibit the employment of a relative of any classified employee or teacher as coach in an interscholastic team. And then the other one says, no other individual shall be employed who is related to any member of the board unless such individual receives affirmation vote of a majority of all member of the board other than the members related to the applicant who shall not vote. So one says, 304 says, we can hire whoever we want if they're qualified, and that's a PASBA policy. And then 304.1 says, we can't. Have they given us any clarification on the legalities of this? Um, well, pass, but that, that one, we didn't send that to Super Spring. We looked at some other ones with Super Spring in regards to that. Well, we, we had put it on hold and said we need PASBA to clarify why they have conflicting. Um, who, who would contact PASBA? Yeah. I'll let the record show 615. Scott Potts has joined the meeting. So we're on 304.1, uh, 304. Basically, the we were trying to update the nepotism policy given the the hiring of uh, Mrs. Martino, well, and there was some. Was, there was, was a question I asked you last, say several years ago, but so we had individuals that spouses would like to come to work here. I think we could have retained some. But they said they thought there was a policy in place that they couldn't have a husband and wife. Well, what's it? Well, what's interesting is that there's there's PASBA has a nepotism clause in in the 304. Which is which is regarding employ, employees, and then. And they're conflicting, so they updated the nepotism piece, but the the, the original 304 says it's fine if you have a majority vote. Well, they're saying this, and this isn't a this isn't a change. Apparently, this has been an issue. This isn't an update. So this is, you know, usually when there's an update, it's all in bold. These policies haven't changed. In fact, the only one that did change was 304, which was was where they basically defined uh, no other individual. They had called out teachers shall not be employed who is related to anyone in the board unless the majority of the board votes. Here's what Pasma said. The nepotism policy is strictly the end of policy. We do not offer a nepotism policy. The language may be revised to reflect the language you so desire. Policy 304 reflects standard language. The SBA's policy, this language, is also in your own employment policies. It's yeah. required and may be removed language regarding teachers being employed who is related to them. The board is so we don't even need a nepotism policy is what they're saying because basically 304 covers it it's just it's just not called out as nepotism that's why there was no updates to it we added it even though it's already the PASBA 
version, and it says that it's defined in law that unless a teacher receives affirmation vote from a majority of all board members, other than the member related to the applicant who shall not vote. So our policy conflicts with what's in law. Because we're just, we basically said, I guess at some point, the board took a stand and said, we're just not going to allow it. Which, I don't know, I felt like when we had that discussion in the, in the moment, everyone was feeling very comfortable with hiring. I mean, it just happened to be Mr. Martino's wife. Well, they're, they're more qualified. I can't imagine why. Right. So is our recommendation that we just get rid of the nepotism policy? Because it feels like one was created to address a certain situation that someone didn't care for. So if we get rid of this policy, we, are, we have the other policy still. The, the it one. already has it spelled out that, like, remember when Jim and Mike had a policy? Well, they had the wrong one. They really should have been referencing this one, which is current. Yeah. They had, like, a really old one. But this is the most recent, and this is from PASBA, and it says that by law, you can do it. It's nothing illegal. You just have to have majority vote without the person who's a, uh, related to vote. I mean, it seems more than reasonable. I mean, I prefer that I, I don't want to just eliminate the nepotism policy, but if it, I want it to reflect the law as closely as possible. I don't want to be overly restrictive. I'd rather just mirror the language of the, the letter of the law in our policy. Well, if you follow the past, then we're free to doing correct? Yeah, the, I mean, it, it has a supporting doc, uh, document tagged in it. Um, hold on, I'll tell you what it is. I need to turn change and say, you know, that line about how something can be hired Oh, you got a you got an email from Adele Mixel. Yes. Kathy put it in here. Okay. <laughs> She's good. I didn't get that far. I'm sorry. Yeah, here it is from Pasba. I mean, she said basically we can we can eliminate 304 if we want, but that that's the only policy that's supported in PASBA. The nepotism was strictly, and that came to be on June of 2015. Well, but it doesn't have anything in addition. It doesn't have anything additional to it other than what's already in this. It's it's basically the whole policy is you can't hire anybody related to a board member. And we don't like that policy. I, I we've we've already voted against it, so I don't see why we would want to Can keep we it. We change this nepotism policy though to say what? what was we can, yeah, yeah. If you just want to say that you can't hire uh, just to else. just to call it out, so it's yeah, so very clear. You're right. So it's fine. It's easy to find. All right. Like that. Clarity is what I think I In that case, we're not, we're not sending the message that nepotism is okay, which some people might disprove. All right, so I'm going to strike this language. I guess you're right. That would, it reads a little differently that you're removing the nepotism policy, even if you explain that right. it's already covered in a. Yeah. It's one of those things that'll cycle for, for years. The board that updating a policy doesn't doesn't make news unless it's no, right. unless it's. Uh, 
are replaced with. I mean, the goal is to hire the best players. The best yeah. Right. All right. I think we got it then. She had this email in here, so. Yeah, she, she does an awesome job preparing this stuff. I mean, it's like, it's called Policy Review Committee for Dummies. I just, it's, it's all listed, it's all nice and clean, <laughs> exactly. She knows me well. All right, so now we can scoot on to new business. What are the legal next? Oh, yeah, should we talk about those? Um, yeah, let's skip to the legal review. So there's... Do you have updates on that? Yeah, I can, I can help you a little bit with some of this. Um, let's go to... Let's go to policy 336. All right, you want to skip to 336? Yeah. All right. Yep, I got it. Um, That's a personal necessity leave. Yeah. What? So this one was looks to be a, a new policy from PASBA or but or, cause, or just completely rewritten because everything in it is bold and looks like to be replaced. Okay, the phrase we need to add to this um, current school law is um, 311 we're dealing with uh, bereavement days for an immediate family and one day for a near relative that's current school law. The, our current collective bargaining agreement with our teachers is five and three. Your current collective bargain, bargaining agreement with your administrators is three and one, um, so it's different. So okay. the phrase we want to put in there, okay, is unless otherwise provided in a current collective bargaining agreement yeah, because this is going to change. This is all bargained. So what's that? This is all bargained. Yeah, and that's why we want. So to put putting it in policy is just going to create problems. And that's why we want this generic phrase in there. If we put a generic phrase, unless otherwise provided in a current collective bargaining. So I should put it in after where it says five school days. Yes. And then we put a sentence in there. Okay, I mean, that, that's the out clause. Is if we have a collectively bargaining agreement that's different than this. Um, than what's right here, then um, it goes to that collective part. I mean, that'll give us a legal out, but there is no way, I think, after we pass this policy that we could bargain to lower bereavement leave after, like, if we say the policy that's five, even though it says that it's subject to the bargaining. I thought it was less than five. That was one of the big snafus they were unhappy with. It's three and one is what the, um, in, the, current, the, in, the in the current, but in the current bargaining agreement, I thought it was three and one. Five, is it? Because that was one of the things they were upset about. Well, they were upset that we talked about changing it. Yeah. Like one of the they didn't even like we were having the conversation. They thought it was just... Which I agree. I think that's... it's. I, so, I mean, if the board were to... Like we need to pick our battles. Like, that's not right, one. Yeah. Like, like so your, 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 your son gets killed in the... Yeah. Like, oh, I only need three days. I'm like... Right. So I'm just saying this would... You'd be lucky for him to come back to work. This would end that we wouldn't have that battle anymore. No. I mean, that's just like the right, a right thing to do kind of thing. Okay. I just to right? Like, I mean. Well, it's immediate family member, so. I think. It doesn't specify who they are. You brother, sister, or father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter, husband, wife, parent, in law, and your relative who resides in the same household, or in any person with whom the employee is being. Yeah, like I don't have a problem with it, but it is going to, I think, have ramifications on future negotiations that didn't exist this time around. That being said, even if this policy were in place, it wouldn't change the outcome of the negotiations because we never really made a serious bid to, to decrease. So I should say, unless stated differently in the current collective bargaining agreement? Or compensation plan. So that way, it okay. all of our employees. Because it's different right now. Right now, it's not the same. Your teachers have 
the most than your administrators, and to be honest with you, I didn't even look at the classifies, so they didn't know what those are. So. Well, and I think this is going, I don't know how we keep the administrators at three and one after passing this policy also, because it's easy, like if I were a, one of the Act 93 group, and I came back and said, hey, listen, the policy says five and one, well, except, like, I, I, I mean, the reality is, like, Jim's going to say, you know, if you need five days, take five days. Like, he's not going to tell someone they got to come back to work. Right. I mean, I my father died. I had five days, and they were like, whenever. Just, yep. you know. I mean, they, they don't want you going on in perpetuity, but, like, you know, and I took, like, I think I took maybe six days and spread it over two weeks because I had to just take care of business, you know, and it was just hard to do. Yeah. So, I mean... I can't imagine anybody's not going to... No, I don't have a problem with it. You I know what I mean? There are going to be, I think, side effects when it comes to negotiating, for, good, for better or worse. Or I mean, if, if, if any of the agreements say five and three, or, or is three it five, and one, three and one yeah. or if, if any of them already say five and, was it five and one? Five and three and three and one, I think. Right, Rob? Yeah, if it's five and three... All right, so we're, in both sections, we're going to add, unless stated differently in the current collective bargaining agreement or compensation. Uh, what's it called? Compensation plan? Yep. Do we need the, uh, we don't need anyone else to review this. That was his, he said just add that. Okay. And then what's the 330 or 248 unlawful harassment? Yeah, um, Brian is being right. He just uh, completely is in the process of that. There was recently an OCR ruling with a surrounding school district. Um, so this needs to be much more robust than what it is based upon the OCR ruling. Uh, so Brian is rewriting this policy for us. So um, that's what we'll have to revisit this one. All right. So he's basically completely rewriting this policy. Yeah, it wasn't. It didn't cover the most recent All right. That takes care of legal. Um... So that takes us to new business. Um, yes. What's that? Did you read all of those? I, I actually memorized them. Oh, good. Okay. If you could go to page 17 of policy 229, I'd like to talk specifically about the second paragraph. That's right. It sounded good, right? Say it with conviction. All right. So the ones in red are the ones we're supposed to check first. Uh, so let's see, I'll skip down to 304, if I can find it. That's our employment policy. 
so this is, I'm assuming that <laughs> this is 304 employment. Um, well, it's, it's mostly supporting documentation and legal uh, support than it is policy. But we should at least review the, hey. Ooh. Thank you again, this is wonderful. We're very pleased. Um, so we've already, we're, we're all, obviously we're familiar with the, the nepotism section. So the big one is all the, the pre-employment. And I'm, I'm assuming that, I, don't, I can't imagine there's a whole lot of wiggle room on these because it's, it's a state employment guideline. I mean, everything's basically, all of this is defined by state and federal law. So I, I mean, no, I don't think there's any. In fact, the only portion that's even up for debate is the portion that's under the that, that covers the nepotism. That's the only one that we really have any. We can say we're not. This is the recommended, right? But we can legal, what's legal. But we could say, you know, if we wanted to, we could desire and say, no, we're not. Well, I have a question here about these touches for the rob. My question is about the Title I folks, and that, like, I know, like, what about these groups like Teach for America, and I know we don't have those folks in our school district, but what about somebody teaching on an emergency certificate? I don't think they're highly qualified, but they can still go and teach on a road. And I wonder if, if this is a requirement, or if we are going above and beyond. So, I'm going to ask Rob. Rob. Yeah. Um, I have a question here about the Title I requirements for yes. hiring new staff. It says all elementary, middle school, middle and secondary teachers employed by the district to teach poor academic subjects shall be highly qualified as defined by federal law and state regulations. Mm -hmm. What if we have someone who's teaching on like an emergency certificate or somebody with Teach for America or a group like that? I know we, we don't have anyone with title with right. federal programming because of what you're saying right there. That's just um, these, that's what UGG guidance right there that's consistent, that language. Um, the, they, we make sure that those people are highly qualified and they have appropriate certifications uh, with the state of So this doesn't mean that they have to have gone, you know, the four-year program to be a teacher. This could, have been, this could be somebody who's teaching on an emergency certificate. As long they would have to be emergency certified. Um, basically, the, the short, if I can give you the yes. short answer to that is you, you wouldn't, uh, for example, Title I, uh, under Title I funding, you may have a reading specialist Part of their salary may be paid through a Title I funding, and you couldn't have a someone who's not a reading specialist teaching the reading, even if they're an outstanding yeah. have a background. Right. And, yeah, they, you could be an expert in something and not have the degree. Is that only using Title I money? Like, if we hire somebody on our own who's really a fantastic reading specialist, although they might not be trained as a reading specialist? In theory, you want to get an emergency cert, is what you want to do for anyone. Now, would this preclude that? The line that they have to be highly qualified. That's a, that's a technical term, I know. That doesn't mean highly qualified in our meeting. Because if somebody, you know, if Mr. Rogers came to work for us, I'd consider him highly qualified. But he might not be highly qualified in the Department of Education's eyes. Yeah. And I see this, this policy. But see it this way, I, in Title I areas, because it's big dollars at stake right there, I mean, I wouldn't mess with that. I would make sure I'd move people to make sure that we had someone with an appropriate certification. The risk or reward of being yeah. wrong and, and so on. Okay. Pointing that out is not worth it for the school district because the risk will work on that. So that with the Title I stuff, we're pretty, pretty extraordinarily careful about that stuff. But um, okay. you know, I believe, I get, and I'm not aware of that, but I do believe the interpretation would be that if, as long as they had the emergency certification and we went through the emergency certification process for that, and say we got someone with an emergency certification as a reading specialist, I believe that would be acceptable under federal UGG guidance. Uh, what is UGG? Uh, uniform Grant Guidance, um, it's basically recently gone into effect. It was, um, it was um, done with the um, oh, SSA legislation that was passed in recently in the last couple of years. So, basically, the, the 
essence of some of that stuff is it, doing things that was good practice anyway, like, okay, what actual performance goals, like, you know, it, it, setting measurable performance goals, things that, that we do anyway, but it kind of codified some things there, codified a lot more stuff. All of our teachers right now are officially highly qualified, right? It's not until I number somewhere to say that. We have any emergency, I don't believe we have any emergency certification. But is that the only way you want to be not highly qualified? You know, emergency that's certification. what they're talking about, it, okay. is that type of thing. I mean, that, that's what they're talking about. I mean, really where you end up with emergency certification. First, you, you get a lot of that in the um, urban school right. districts, um, like Philadelphia, you can't get enough science teachers, for yeah. example. Um, where, where it gets challenging to get into emergency certs is um, where you might, say physics is almost impossible to hire, um, that, that type of stuff where they're, you're just competing, they're gonna pay them 200,000 over at Limerick and because it's in our backyard, you know, yeah. for the same physics person we have here, you know, so that the market, we're below the market on that kind of stuff. So, right, okay. Does that help a little bit? Kind of. All right. Sorry, no, I, I, I was, I'm sorry. sorry. It's, sorry. Fine. it's best how it was when I was Too much information, yeah. sorry. Connor loves these types of conversations. Well, you know, I'm never satisfied by the answer. That's the problem. <laughs> Might be the right answer, but it's not the answer I want. <laughs> All right, so this is 915. So this is uh, the booster support organizations. Um, it's an old policy from March 2015. Uh, PASBA does not have any policy for this. So this is specifically for us. Um, so Lauren wanted to update. That we just, he basically just wants to update the doc when the documents need to be submitted. So, the board requires from each group, booster support organizations, annual report, a list of current officers, including contact information, and a current statement of bylaws, objectives of the group, and a copy of approved budgets. These documents must be submitted to the Daniel Boone or to the district business office by August 31st of each school year. Lauren wants this change to July 31st. And I'm guessing because when we get them that late and it messes up the budget. So he has, and then in section three, it's kind of the same thing. It, it says the board sets forth the policy to maintain its legal and ethical responsibilities in relation to booster support organizations. Approval of booster support organization must be obtained annually in August of each year from the school board. So, well, if we're. I, I, I wouldn't submit that while they can submit it, but you need approval. Right, so he's saying you got to get it to us by July so that we can approve it in August. Which I think they were trying to somewhere happen at the beginning of August. So it well, that's what I'm saying. He was saying that they were getting the. We were having. We were saying we had to approve it. But we were—they weren't even having, having to give us the information until. Well, I think last year might have been a, a scheduling or a date issue where one group did, one group didn't until later on in the month. So. If, if we update this, I mean, who who lets them know? Is that Lauren that lets them know? <laughs> Both entities know, as far as the music goes, and the sports groups do know that they're pretty religious on this. So what was the? So if he had such an issue with it, why do you want to change it? Uh, it's just up with budgetary numbers, but we're already in the budget in June, so why does he need it in July to be something that's been? I'm guessing it might just be like a compliance thing, like not wanting to approve it after. I mean, if he wants to review it in July, yeah. well, if you're saying July 31st, so. What I heard in his answer is why he wants to change I would think you'd want to get it before July 31st, so you can put it on, on the schedule. Anyone know Lauren's phone number? Yep. I'm guessing he's up there.
of all of our administrators, he'd appreciate it at least, I think. Scott Potts is no, no one was. <laughs> I could be wrong. Lauren. Yeah. It's Jeff Scott. Yes, sir. We're looking at uh, the booster support organization's policy. Yes. And you had asked to change the date for submittal of the of their uh, budget documents and annual reports. Yeah, to I guess it, 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 it contradicts itself, and it says that it needs to be approved by the board in August. Reports aren't due until the end of August, so I said. I had said before when they were reviewing it, change the date of submittal to July 31st. There aren't any meetings in August to do anything anyway. So if the reports were submitted by July 31st, then I'll put it on the calendar approval in August. And it'll be approved by August 31st. That's the only change you have to make. Is the date okay. Of All right. That's it. We just wanted to clarify that there wasn't some underlying issue we weren't aware of. No, 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 that's it. It's just a discrepancy because you can't, obviously you can't approve it in August by the board if I don't receive it until the end of August. So right. it's just up to getting the middle date to July 31st. All right, thanks. Okay. Yep. that help you? It does, thanks. All right, see you in a little bit. So it was just that. It was, it makes no sense to have them required to give it to us at the end of the month. If it has to be approved, he said this way, we don't meet in July. I can work, I can talk to them and get everything set up so that we can get it on the cow for the first August meeting. I mean, as long as he, if we let him know, like. And I think for the, on the sports side, it's going to be much easier since that came back in house to manage all the. Attendance. Policy 204. New version. I think we were a little bit flexible if the kids out of 11 or 12. 
not that is you don't want to work them in the state, but our expectation is 10. That's why. That's that's reporting illnesses, not educational trip. Like they're out five days. That doesn't is that when that that 10 day window. You, usually, what we do is like we, and then this is where the, the judgment comes in. If you look at it, or if the kid was out for. 11 days, for example, five were because they went on an educational right. trip. We might count that as one day out of the 11, like we might put them again. We're so, like, let's say for any people are, you pay people to use judgment. If the kid goes out and, and has uh, mono in and yeah. out for, you know, seven days, all right, that's one, you know, you look at that as one incident out of Syria, but that was a documented incident. You, you can use a little bit of judgment and leeway in that. And I think you can do it. So, common sense, I guess. I don't know how you write in there and use common sense, <laughs> you know. Well, we just need to make sure that it wouldn't tie the hands because if this says that a student who, it, it's ill days, if you're out because you're ill, you can yeah. stay up for 10, and that wouldn't, if I were a parent and I went and read this and I said, well, we were out for a week for our educational travel trip, you can't count that at all. Yeah, there must be specific then. If like, it it depends, specific. yeah, for something like this, when we say explicitly illness, now if we want to have a little bit of leeway, we can word it that way, but I just want to make sure, and I don't know exactly what it says, um, I haven't read the whole thing, but I, I mean, I'm being fine to stick with what we have is working mm -hmm. with what we have. Yeah. And do we make a lot of, if, can you give me an example of a, let's say we referred someone for truancy, how many days did they miss? You, I mean, after, after the third, their third excuse, unexcused that's an unlawful, and when we say unexcused, that's without. And that means no notes. notes right? the, next, the, the next one, okay, after that, um, and when they get to that point, we, we do what's called a truancy intervention plan. We sit down with the parents and the kids find out why they're not going to school. So they know it's serious yeah, by yeah. that point. We know it's a serious situation. It's not a kid forgetting notes, but right, that happens a lot. They, they just forget to write the notes, or kids don't bring them in. And we solve that real easily. But the, where we do get into situations, you know, we sit down and it's a real truancy situation and try to address the causes so it doesn't repeat itself through the truancy intervention. And the parents by that point know that it's a big problem. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yep. They get letters from us, they get phone calls from Are us. Are you satisfied with how we do it now? Yeah, very satisfied. Okay. I have a question though. Um, third page under educational tours and trips. How do, how do, is this an example of this? Is this like a, a trip that they're planning to take to, was it Brazil or, or Costa Rica they're going to with the kids? It's a non school sponsored trip. The way that's written, yeah, that could, that could, if that occurred during the school year, yes, that would be the case. So that, those folks came here to present to us and they were to, taking their trip not during the school year. Yeah, that, that one, if my recollection would be with a lot of the stuff, so bear with me. It was a husband and wife, I think they came up, right? They're two teachers. I mean, like, for example, I think if, if a family decides they want to miss a whole market period, you know, like that, that's, I mean, those are things that you need to have long discussions with the family over, you know, whether, you know, the, 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 what you get out of the trip versus what they're going to miss out of the trip. That didn't really answer your question. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is they, they came in here and presented, but they didn't really have to because it wasn't during school time. Are you talking about the Spain trip? Yeah. Or the Dominican Republic? The Dominican Republic. Yeah, June 20th. 20th. Uh, That's outside of the school. Yeah, so they didn't have to come here, but they came here to seek approval from us, and they didn't have to. Yeah, I don't I don't think they did, but I, I think they want to advertise to our students. I think that's why the abundance of caution. Yeah. And they want to do a trip. Yeah. yeah. So they, and they're soliciting our students to go along with that. Okay. So this trip will be done under the Daniel. Yes, but so I think we have some kind of liability. Yeah, sure. And I think that's why they get it. I think they're being, they're erring on the side of caution, which is generally what we ask them to do. We 
would rather not have a problem than you guys get the supplies on. All right, so we good with just changing the 10 days then? And I believe that's one of the metrics that a lot of places uh, evaluate, they evaluate schools on it. This is a great school, they have low unattended. Right, absolutely. Student records. This is, doesn't get into how long we're required to keep it. There's another policy. That's what that, I thought. That's the um, record retention schedule. It's, it's, um, okay. Records, not yeah, like how long we have to keep the stuff? Yeah, that's a different one. And maybe they can cross-reference each other. Maybe we can combine them somehow. But in here, it says under guidelines that the school district has to take certain steps. Like it says in here, the procedures for requesting amendment for students' education records need to be developed procedures for requesting an effective hearing. Like we have to come up with a plan, the district, to address all of these things that are laid out in here. And there's these, well, there's 12 points right there, and then I think there's a whole other section up here at one point. But yeah, I believe the policy that has that schedule in it is something like 20 pages long or something outrageous. And I think that Scott Matz is the custodian of all that. Yeah. And Scott was saying over here that it depends, like if a student has an IEP plan, there's a different timeline than if it's a regular ed student. And there are different rules for, you know, just basic information that the student graduate versus report cards versus, I guess, immunization records. Like, it's pretty complicated. And I mean, it could be a job in and of itself just keeping up with all that stuff and making sure it's disposed of properly. And there's supposed to be a committee, actually, that we're on as a member, as a chairman of this committee. Um, I think it's the records management committee or something, and they're supposed to handle all that stuff. So I guess you haven't been involved. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know it existed. Yeah, they meet once a year. And I think it might be special. Are you aware of that? <laughs> you're on it, you're the chair. You know. I don't know if you're the chairman of it. But <laughs> that's a decision. I'm like, you must have got a lot done. because I. Throw something at me. <laughs> well, it's important that that committee meet. Like, I don't know if it's ever actually met. And it really should, because those are important things, especially when you talk about privacy and all that stuff. So I'm surprised. Was Mrs. Carol was chairman of this committee before, right? She was all into privacy. I mean, maybe she attended, I don't know. Do you know about it? What I will say is I, um, I have spoken to Scott about this. One of the, one of the things we need to do, um, and I would, what I was looking at, they're suggesting policy areas. Maybe we want to get everything in writing that we're currently doing in terms of our practice. Terms of like yeah, what, do we have our plan? We have a written down, documented yeah. plan for all we, this? We want, to, we want to get it down in writing. That's what I was talking to Scott about. And then the other piece of this, when I was, when I was talking to Scott, I said the other thing is we, like, I, I'll just give you an example. Students' Q folder right now, like, it is a Q folder. That needs to be electronic. And this is a logical time. I was talking to Scott, let's get this digital. Let's start doing this stuff digitally, not by, you know, because we're, we're still doing the old fashioned way where the kids have, you know, it's just a Q folder by time into the high school with all the records. So I, I think it's time to get um, some document written things down here in terms of our current procedures in regards to that. And then um, number two, I think it's also time to get digital. Some 
Yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. When I chaired this committee, when I was a senior in high school, I wanted to go see my record just for fun, see what was in it. And I went down to the guidance department. I was the only student who ever did this and asked to see my record, and they gave it with, to me. My guidance counselor was sitting with me as I went through it. They had all like old photos of me and then old report cards. It was interesting to look at, but it really should be electronic now. Um, so I guess we have a hold somewhere sitting with you know, a bunch of vanilla folders full of yeah, you know, There's a locked room in each of the buildings that they were passed up grade level, grade level as, as kids. So does that mean we have like a truck that drives them over, like when fifth grade <laughs> moves on to middle, middle school? And That's when? literally what happens. So I mean, the folders are literally moved from one to the next. Well, we and what about the ones who are the graduating classes? Okay, and they're held on to, and I think, and I have to look at my notes on that, I think it's seven years ago. So where do we keep all those? I think that's what state, state law. You keep them in the high school? And that I don't know exactly what your school is, but I think that's what I'll get back to that chapter certainly. Okay. Any concerns about the policy? Yeah, I think we need to do a whole lot more in house to, to do better with this stuff. Uh, graduation. Policy 217. We'd like some more time as an administrator to continue working with this. Um, there's a whole variety of reasons why, not limited to keystone exams, changes in laws. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we'd like some more time. Uh, there's a lot of things that are in flux right now. This is interesting here. The superintendent shall submit to the board for its approval the names of veterans of World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War who are eligible for a high school diploma. I, I, you sometimes see the news stories of like a hundred, one guy who's 100 years old finally getting a high school diploma. And I wonder if we have anybody in the school district who may have fought into these conflicts, may be eligible. You know, it would be pretty old by now, but I've, I've never seen that before in any policy that we can give a diploma. How do we know, though? The superintendent apparently needs to find out. Veterans. Veterans. Sounds like a good committee for a veteran board member like Connor to head up. I might be a true veteran. As the elder statesman of this group. Do I get a pension or something? So you can see when we get um, student complaint process. I think we should get rid of this policy. There should be no complaining by students. Um, This one is confusing to me because it just, I, I don't really know that there's, like, this just basically says that the board will acknowledge a student complaint. That's really all it says. I don't know what the purpose of that. I mean, it's not like we don't listen to students or have conversations with students. It must be the world is great. Is there is there a formal complaint process for students for them to like anonymously or in person uh, file complaints against I don't know other students other teachers against other po uh, against our policies? They, they can file Right. 
quite obviously, in terms of the students do complain about things that they need to sort of investigate them in terms of whether they're not in class or something like that. I don't know if there's anything that they're saying. That's not very informal, you know, in regards to that. Um, yeah. 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 The, the student complaint policy? Yeah, I looked at that, and it, it doesn't seem there's no like guidelines or anything in there. I, I, I'm struggling with why it even exists. I mean, other than to say, it's like it's a statement of value. we're just going to put it in writing that we will yeah, we'll acknowledge and value the student complaints. There should be. Like, we have a policy in place for complaints for staff members or I think even parents. Like they, a, they work their way up. First, you go to the teacher, then you go to the principal. It gives an outline of how you properly resolve complaints. Maybe we have something similar to this. In that case, you don't have somebody like me when I was 17 years old from the school board meetings and harassing the board. Yeah. Mr. Utterly, how, how did this fall? Do you, do you follow any of these guidelines in this policy? Did, do we follow school policy? Yeah. Well, no, well, <laughs> do, you, do you go in there? Word by word, we look at policies. Yeah, you do. But I mean, if you have a parent complaint, you take that by a valor and, and follow through. Or yeah, do, you do you tell parents to go back and, like, let's say you get an email saying that I don't like the way that Mrs. So and So is treating my kid? Do you go to Mrs. So and So and ask what's up, or do you tell the parent to, hey, you have to talk to Mrs. So and So, then you have to talk to Mr. Miller, then you have to talk to me? Yeah, and do you, do you reroute them to the proper course? And yes, we do, depending on what the question is and the concern is, we do reroute them to the appropriate place. And generally speaking, we go about with, you want to call it, you want them to talk to the teacher first about the concerns that they have. But like, if, if there's real serious things, obviously, that's the problem. But generally, and then you work your way up to the, the principal, assistant principal, principal, things like that, depending on if the issue's actually resolved. I think it might be helpful to have a policy for students how to resolve complaints appropriately. I don't think this does it. And if we're going to have anything, I don't. I I just feel like it does say that the student shall not be subjected to any reprisals because of filing a complaint. And I know that of course it's common sense and it shouldn't be, but uh, you know. but some yeah, but this doesn't even get into how a complaint is supposed to be filed. And that's something that should. All right, new policy, um, student expression, distribution, and posting of materials. It is a brand new one. Yes, it is. I'm anxious to see a disciplinary action.
based on Tinker versus the point of the legal precedent. And again, there's other case law too, but that was the big case in my life. Yeah, so I have a fun personal experience with Mr. Daniel. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really fun because I think that the school district violated my first amendment rights. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was in high school, <laughs> it was the 2012 presidential election. And I manufactured some stickers that were critical of the Democratic Party's nominee for president. And I gave them out to some people who asked for them. And uh, the, these stickers were taken from me by a fellow student, given to a teacher, and I was called to the office the next day. I was told that I couldn't distribute my political stickers. They were, I, I, they were called propaganda. And I told them about Tinker, and I was told that uh, if this went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would rule on the side of Obama if he was elected, and they'd rule on the side of McCain if he were elected. The reason for that is because they wouldn't want to upset the president, which of course is nonsense. And I, uh, I think that we have a, we need to make sure that this is implemented in a way that students can exercise their right to free speech, because I don't think we've always done that. So uh, thank you for letting me tell that story. Clearly, it still bothers me. Uh, but I think we need to do better on this front. Um, well, but I mean, none of us are allowed to post anything that's like we, you and I can't. The teachers can't. But kids, I think they have a, in the school they can talk to their peers. Like even that election where, I mean, we had some issues. Kids can talk. They can form political alliances. They can go and find. Well, their well, their violation was they used school. They yeah. used the school studio to right. You can't use, to create the the you message. Use government property. But no. You can't tell a kid. You can't talk about that. No, talking's one thing. They're talking about um, distribution and posting of materials. Well, I think that you... Like you can't walk around the school and just put up, like, concert, you know, uh, advertisements for a, a concert that has nothing right. to do with the school. You can't do that, and you also can't post, I believe, as long as, you, like, if we would... So you can't post, a, post about anything political, that's one thing, but you can't, make, you can't discriminate based on viewpoint. Like, if people were allowed to hand out pamphlets saying come to the car wash on Thursday, they're also allowed to hand out pamphlets and say come to the political rally on Thursday. That's students, not staff, because staff are acting on behalf of the district. Because the way it reads is they have to create them or distribute them as part of the curriculum. I want to say, uh, I want to read this more in depth than before <laughs> I put on it at least, but I mean, if it's all law, I mean, this is like, the law is, is pro free speech. Non-school materials, like the... Almost to the bottom of the first page. Sorry, what was that, Jen? Non-school materials and posting. Okay, distribution of non-school materials. Yeah. You'll know, submit them one day in advance. A form copy. So it's for review. If it's for review, yeah. And then it'll be up to it'll be internal to determine whether or not. Uh, materials are protected speech or not. So, I mean, this would be a good way because if the superintendent comes back and says, no, you can't distribute this, then the student would have a very clear recourse in the district denying them that right. And if they want to pursue it, they can. It's clear. So, so we're not moving on with this one? No, I think we can move on. I'm just asking, like you said I mean, you want I, I have a lot I still want to read anyway, and I'd like, it would be good if we could get supers to weigh in on it. I think even though has already has, if there's some specific speech issues again, you know, like, okay, good. All right. I reserve the right to, to bring up a duly noted. Yes. Okay. Let the minutes reflect that Connor would like further investigation well, on this. I will conduct further investigation. All right. That's what I like to hear. All right. We'll do one more here. Um, student, oh, we just did that one. Uh, care of school property. Also a new policy from PASBA. I mean, I this feels like, I don't know if you read this one, but this is like, it's pretty common, pretty much common sense. Like, it shocks me that we'd even have a policy like this. I don't know if... <laughs> You feel like we need to have anything specific for Boone? Yeah, specific. I mean, it's right, pretty general. Like you, like, you know, like I don't. I'm not quite. Yeah, I, this one is an odd one. Like it's common sense, right? Like you destroy property. 
yeah. the board has the right to prosecute. Yeah. Well, there's an issue with high school because there was at one point a bill that said that It says, and related information that the superintendent deems necessary. So basically, if the administration feels like it's not warranted, to, then it's... Like, we're not going to hire somebody or replace a desk because some kid writes on it. Even though technically that's vandalism. I don't know. The way I read it is that if there's an incident of vandalism, then the, board, if the superintendent needs to say if there's an incident of vandalism. But that's all he's obligated to say. The other stuff, the deems necessary as ancillary information. Like, see what I'm saying? Like, the first line is if there's vandalism, that incident needs to report to the board. And then the second line is extra information, the number and kind of incident, the cost of the district. If the superintendent thinks that information is necessary, but the incident needs to be reported all the time, no matter what the superintendent thinks of its importance. Now we can change that if you agree with how I'm reading it. Well, but it also it also states that the superintendent and the administration basically create the specific policies. Yeah, the only thing it says to is administer. Yeah, the administration of it all is up to the administration. However, within that administration, the board has to know. So we can strike that line if we don't think that the board needs to hear about every incident. It maybe it's overkill having that, but it also doesn't say when they have to report. It could be an annual report. It could be an executive session. It could be well, maybe it's just an executive session, but it could be over email. Like it doesn't specify the nature of the report. Just that the report has to be made. And we should be tracking these incidents. So if this principal sees, you know, somebody etched something in a, a seat in the auditorium, then that should be documented somewhere, and it should be monitored. All right, so we'll just add the phrasing in there that they only need to tell us about anything that they feel is necessary. Right, like okay. something, I mean, I, I something significant. Well, what is significant? Like, well, like we're, well, I think the significant is there's, like, there's a big difference between writing on a desk and spray painting yep. profanity on a, Jim you know, floor. Yeah. Jim's when, car. Uh, when I was there, uh, there was an incident that um, there's, a, there's a seat in the auditorium where there was a swastika. Right. I think I think that's clearly significant. Okay. Right. Like. Right. But I mean, what else? Like just scribbling. Like also, an issue. again, they just the administration decides what the penalty is. So, like, if it's something that strong, or they feel like they need to expel a student. I don't think there was any. I, I would think that they that would be something we'd be notified about. Right. Yeah. But what if? I mean, what if we don't know about these things? Like, what if somebody is you know spray painting profanity on on the side of the building? And I mean, I don't know. We were told that there was different colored paint in the bathroom. I think we'd know that there was somebody spray paint in the hallways. I hope so. But At least it would be brought to us. Casey would bring it to us in the in the finance uh, the facilities committee. Okay. I mean, I'm not. I don't think it's worth talking about too much. As long as we know if, if there's a big issue, we want to hear about it. We want to make sure that you guys are dealing with it. Rob's predominantly concerned about his personal property. He doesn't want any of that damage. But other than that, he's good. All right, we'll, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I object to 10 minutes, but I'm overruled. All right.